I'm so excited for today's episode. It is a special episode for me as I'm welcoming my mentor and one of the most incredible humans I've ever met, Robert Walker. Bob took a chance on me in 2015 and the opportunity to truly change my life. If it wasn't for his guidance, I'm not sure I'd be on this sober and recovery journey, and I mean that. So let's dive into Bob's life story of putting purpose over profit and measuring our lives by the impact we make. Welcome to Small Steps, Big Change, the podcast where we meet extraordinary people who have used small steps to help create big change. I'm your host, Drew Sullivan. In August of 2020, after years of alcohol and cocaine use, I hit rock bottom. I knew at this moment that I had no choice but to get sober. Through lots of hard work and dedication, I made that a reality. I have to admit, I thought that this would fix everything and that a life filled with happiness would just follow. But sobriety was only the first step for me. I had to be sober before I was ever going to rebuild my life and recover all that was lost. I kept going, focusing on the next right move, or as I call it, the next small step. I then took the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. Every day is a journey for me, and I now believe that I'm in the middle of the most beautiful recovery story of all time. What I have learned is that my story has a lot in common with anyone looking to make big changes in their life. That's why it is time that we work together to make big things happen. Each week on this podcast, I will introduce you to a friend who has used small steps to help create their big change. We are all going through something, and it is my goal that by sharing our stories and bringing vulnerability and empathy to the forefront, we can learn from each other and take the small steps that are needed to create big change. Robert Walker. He is known to his friends and colleagues as Bob, founded American Program Bureau, or APB, to provide an open forum for individuals to voice their opinions and point of view. Today, APB has the largest speaker roster in the industry, from entertainers and politicians to business leaders and renowned public intellectuals. A pioneering force in the lecture industry, Bob and the team at APB Speakers created the medium for people to see the most exciting and popular personalities, hear cutting edge ideas, and experience the leaders, activists, and innovators of the day, live and in person, unedited and unfiltered by mass media. Upon founding APB in 1965, Walker reinvented the traditional lecture by creating infotainment to transmit the innovative intellectual excitement of a dynamic time in an entertaining format. From colleges to town halls and community forums, and onto corporations and trade and professional associations, this fourth medium offered audiences what they could not get elsewhere. To this day, under Walker's guidance and leadership, APB's culture of innovation continues to define each era while always looking into the future. Hey, Bob, how's it going? I'm okay for an old man. <laughs> oh, please. You don't even think that. Joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> Maybe physically, but mentally, you don't feel that way. Gotcha. No, mentally, I feel like I'm 25, really, 26. Maybe 27. Yeah. Well, that was a decent amount ago, right? Like a good amount of time ago when you were actually that age. I mean, you grew up in the Bronx. I know your story so well. So when I was thinking about what am I going to talk to you about, I said, I feel like I know so much about you that there was such a menu of subject areas that I said, what would be best for the audience to chat about? But to kind of go back, I think uh, 1940s, 1950s, you grew up in the Bronx and that was a long time ago before you embark on this type of a career journey of a lifetime, I guess you could say. Can you share a little bit about your childhood? And did you always have such a charismatic salesman personality? Oh, yeah. I was born a salesman. That's what my mother used to say to you. I was born a salesman. Interesting. Middle class family, grew up in the Bronx, New York. I never really wanted much. If I had my baseball glove and a bat and a ball and a basketball, I was happy. And that was really it. But lovely parents taught me values, which is very important. My mother said to me, and I've lived by this for all my years. She said, if you want to be a success in life, follow one rule. It's called the golden rule. And what is the golden rule? Do unto others as you want others to do unto you. And I've always believed in that, even growing up. Yeah, you're saying leadership. I always was the captain of the team. I would be the ones that would go out and get raffles for jackets and for uniforms because we couldn't afford them. So we had to have a raffle to get that. Like I said, I always had a leadership position in the things I, and I did growing up. 
And it was funny. It was one of my dearest friends who lives in San Diego and we still speak every week. And he grew up in the Bronx with me and he was two years younger than me, Freddie. And Freddie always said, do you remember my uncle Melty? He always said, you're going to be a success because the way you talk, I didn't know the way I talk, but I always felt very positive about myself. Never really gave that too much of a thought. I always believed that there isn't a self, anything that I could accomplish if I put my mind to it. I always had that sort of confidence, let's say. That's, you're talking about 12, 13, 14, and 15, 16 years old. And, you know, I always worked. Uh, I always had to do something, not that I had to work, but I always believed in, in working, even just learning how to be a salesperson. I'll never forget while I was going into, I think my senior year in high school and then into college, I was working as a full of brush salesman. And to me, that was the greatest education in the world. You know, going door to door to people. These were in office buildings. It wasn't the homes. And I used to be selling brushes. And it's a difficult thing for a young kid selling brushes. But the interesting thing about the full of brush company, the full of brushes were really great brushes. So I really was selling a good product, something I believed in. And that's my whole life has been that way. If I believe in something, I could sell it. And that's the secret of my success is basically believing in what I, in what I sell, believing what I do. Yeah. We will talk about that a little bit, but I do, I always say that I, you know, the much shorter career before I landed on your doorstep at APB, but, uh, you know, just came down as a beacon of light from the heavens, I'm sure landing right in front of you. I always say that this was my first job where I felt as if I was selling something that I really believed in. And I think that's something that we have that so many other sales industries don't have. My dad works in tech sales and I know he likes what he does and I know he likes the people he works with and he's good at it, but he doesn't talk to a piece of tech equipment that goes into a computer and he can't be creative with those people and be able to really put your heart and soul into the work you're doing too. Early on for you as a young person and living in New York City and going to school in New York City, and I think you've shared with me the short stint in PR and marketing. That was your kind of first early on. And then you went and started working as a lecture agency at your uncle's agency at the time. And you didn't spend too much time there before you started APB in 1965. Can you take us back to 1965 and just share a little bit around your first couple of years in business and who the first APB speakers were? Let me go back a little further. 65 is great. Of course, the beginning of my trek to success. But Interesting. When I went to college, I switched over to evening school. I was at the Bernie Baruch School of Business down 23rd Street in Manhattan. And I switched to evening school because I wanted to work during the day in a field that I felt it was important to me. And that was public relations because my mother took me when I was around 17 years old. I don't even remember what kind of an organization it was, but they did aptitude tests to see what your aptitude, what you would be good in. And what came out was I like working with people. And that's what it came out. Somebody said, hey, public relations. Again, I wanted to find something in public relations, but there wasn't really jobs that you see in the newspapers. I need a public relations person, et cetera. Most of these PR companies, big PR companies, they would only take people that were former journalists or people working with television, people with a lot of experience. So I went to this employment agency and I said, could you find me a job in public relations? They looked at me like I had two heads. What the heck are you talking about? Public relations. I said, look, let's do this. I was a little creative even with them. I said, give me the telephone book. So I took the yellow pages, opened it up. So we looked at public relations. I see the biggest ad was a company called Hill and Nolte. They were the largest public relations outfit in the world. And to this day, I still remember the name of the person that they were speaking to in personnel. His name was... Harold Brown. How do you like that? After how many years? 75 years. So remember, Harold Brown. And the person got on the phone with Harold Brown said, do you hire people? She said, no, we don't hire. And he's telling how they hire people, what type of people. So I said to this young man who was on the phone with Brown, I said, ask him if he's any jobs available. And he says, any jobs with no experience? She says, well, only job would be in the mail room. And then we have all postal workers, ex-postal workers and people like that. I said, I'll take it. I don't care what it costs. I think they were paying 50 bucks a week or something like that. So that's when I switched over to evening school and I got the job in public relations. And that was the greatest education in the world because things are different these days, because these days in any company, they keep the envelopes closed and they deliver mail 
in an envelope and the individual opens it. In those days, we used to open up all the mail, take the mail and stack them up and go in the order of where you would have to deliver it. And I tell you, the education that I get in reading all this mail, it was unbelievable. I really had a great education and really grew within the public relations field from a mail clerk into publicity, then into when I left which was in 1960, I was the assistant director of radio and television at the biggest public relations outfit in the world. And I'll never forget when I was offered this job in the lecture business in Boston, here I'm in New York, and I went to uh, one of the, he was like my mentor at PR. He was the chief copywriter, his name was Ben Schechter. I used to call him Uncle Ben. When I used to hand their rights to do a, some kind of a, an article or whatever, writing up certain things, he said, give it to me first. He would take it and he would correct it for me. So I would have a good thing to hand it to my boss. And I asked him, I said, should I take this job in Boston with this relative of mine? I have no idea about it. And he said, you really, you zoom like a rocket ship here at Killen Olden, but you're still considered like the mail clerk, even though you're the wonder kid. You still, that's the money you're getting. You're still like the mailroom clerk says, you go take the job. You have nothing to lose because if you don't like it, you can come back to New York. You can get a job at any public relation outfit in New York because you were with the best and you had an opposition here. So there's nothing, no gamble. So I took the shot. I came up around four months before I was getting married in June of 60. And of course, I love the business. I love dealing, being creative, et cetera, et cetera. So that really gave me the good foundation. And then working in the business and seeing what I don't like, that's very important. I said, you know what? When I basically have my own business, and believe me, I wouldn't have started my own business. I just disagreed philosophically with this relative of mine. I just disagreed philosophically. How he's running a company. He believed one thing, I believed the other. I just love working with people and believe in people. He believed in the economic aspects of booking a date. So that's why we never really saw it. I gave like a year's notice to get somebody else. And I said, but I'm going to leave. And this is the business I really want to be in. So of course I started in 1965 and it was tough. How do you start a business? When other than a, a good reputation, and that's very important, I had a good reputation with speakers because people knew, all right? But I didn't want to go into a business competing with my relative. He gave me the opportunity. I didn't want to really compete with it. So I looked at a market that no one was touching, the college and university market. There was no one, really, no agencies in the lecture business was actually working with college and university in 1965. They really weren't working with them. And, you know, I would be calling the schools and trying to find out who would be booking the programs. They had students that were working on the programs, but they always said the faculty were the ones that actually got the program. So they would have somebody that would come in and talk about oral designs, or they would have a, a local politician or somebody that come in and play spoons and sing the Lady of Spain. That was a contemporary program on the college campus. So I asked the colleges, I, these students, I said, it's your funds, it's your money, it's your student activity fees that are paying for this. Yes. Well, don't you have a say in what type of program you want? Well, says, we should. What do you want? In those days, we want civil rights. That was the big issue at that time. So I said, really? I said, yes. So I said, okay. What I did was I went out, I looked, I said, who would be a good speaker in the civil rights? And my first speaker, I'll be frank with you, is Dick Gregory. I found his phone number. How I got it, I don't remember, but I got him in Chicago. He was living in Chicago. I called him up. I got him on the phone. I said, Mr. Gregory, my name is Bob Walker. I have a company. I'm in the lecture business. Is it lecture business? I said, yeah, yeah. I said, would you be interested in going out to colleges and universities? And he said, what, just to talk? Yes, to get up and just talk about what you believe or do your little thing up there. And he said, uh, would I get paid? I said, of course you would get paid for college and universities. And he said, I can't get work on television because I'm talking about so right. I can't get work in nightclubs now and I can't even pay my rent. He says, and you are telling me you can get me dates. And I said, I can try. So of course we signed exclusively in those days. I didn't have a signed contract. And I'll tell you a story about that. We shook hands over the phone, over the telephone. It wasn't even like this having zoom, we can see each other. We shook hands over the phone. And sure right. enough, the first year that I was in business, the first year that I was with Dick Gregory, I got him 155 college dates. 
And it was unbelievable because he would travel from one place to another place. And I'll tell you one thing about him, which a lot of speakers should take, take a lesson from a person like that. Even in the biggest snowstorm, I'll never forget one school that I think it was in St. Louis, Missouri. He was doing the day. It was a major snowstorm and they closed the school. Of course, he says, I'm here at the school. I said, how did you get there? Your plane was getting, no, I took the plane. I, I took a train. I took a car. He did everything to get to that day. And I'll never forget that as long as I live. This man was so dedicated and he acted as a pipe piper on the college campuses because that led to having all these young people follow him truly like the plight by Piper from Bangor, Maine to Bellingham, Washington, all over the country traveling. First of all, it was an honor to represent him. And I considered him a very, very dear friend. Most of these speakers that we got involved with became friends because it wasn't just a job. I believed in what these people were doing. I might not have believed exactly some of the like political aspects of one thing to another, but I believed that they had a right to be on the platform. They had a right to speak to the public and then the intelligent public should have a opportunity to agree or disagree, but it's, it's you know, just open-ended, something like that. The long answer, but that's how I started. And then it just, forget about it. That was like 65 and in 1968, I think it was this young reporter named Natalie Gittleson. Boy, amazing, I can remember the name. I know. Natalie Gittleson came, called me and wanted to do a story on Dick Gregory because it was great success. All of a sudden, a guy who was broke is now doing an unbelievable amount of dates and speaking all over the country. And she wanted to do a story. And so I was talking to her about it. Yes, we can do it. We can talk about it. I said, what else do you do? And I was talking to tell her all the different speakers and everything we're doing. She says, you know what? I'd like to talk about Greg with Dick Gregory, but can I come up and sit down and talk to you? Because you sound like a very interesting person. So I said, okay, come up Saturday because during the week I was working. I could not take the time. Saturday, she came up, spent the whole day with me, interviewed me. And I had no idea what kind of an article it's going to be. I didn't think that, you know, I thought it was a small article about what I was doing. And then around, I forgot how many months later, it was, I think it was February 69. That's when this uh, story came out which was, there's no business like the lecture business. And it sort of painted me more like a radical in the business. And I'll forget my mother calling me that Sunday, when she got the Sunday, wow. she says, you're not a radical. I said, mom, I, 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 they want to call me a radical. They call me a radical, whatever I am. I said, and it's just interesting, you know, how she slanted it. But there again, to me, the thing I do and I've done, and I've always done is I believe in who I represent. To me, the secret of the success is really believing in these people and trusting people that they're going to be as honorable as I will be with them. And that's the main thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's ever slowed down that same mindset. And I think you and I both can say it's for sure the way that I speak to when I'm talking to clients and to speakers is that, that this is something that when you're a good agent, that it's in your blood, it's in your blood just as much as it is the speaker. And that we may not know exactly what to say, cause it's not our work. You know, the expertise in the subject matter is not our work, but when you're good at your job, you do know their work because you are championing their work when you are talking to people about them. And so totally hear that. I mean, one thing that always sticks out to me is that this was a time when black and brown people couldn't even use the same water fountain in some parts of the U S. So to think that these people were once thought leaders who spoke out on the fringe or struggled to find the most viable means for them to get their messages out, you virtually created the avenue for them to be heard. And we've talked about this a number of times in my seven plus years at APB, and you just mentioned it around single-handedly really creating this college and university marketplace. The unapologetic and fearless leadership that you showed during this time when it was so dangerous is what really inspires me on that. And early on, was there ever a moment that you thought representing people who were hated by so many just because of their race or their gender or their sexual orientation, you name it, was too dangerous for you and your family? The funny part was I was so committed that I didn't give it any thought. Wow. We didn't give any thought my whole life up in there. I could tell you stories of other things that I've done that my wife would look at me and say, are you crazy? When you're young, you feel less vulnerable. Let's put it this way. I don't know. Today, it's a whole different story, but yeah, I would say those days. And it's interesting, something you said, and I have to tell you something, Julie, is you remind me a lot of myself in your commitment. And that's very important. You really do. 
And I'm not saying this to blow smoke. But no, no, you really do. And that's very important because you are committed and you do really concern them. I'll use this word, love the people that you are working with and the speakers and you're giving your customers the, to me, the most successful thing is give them what they want. That's the most important thing. And you want to really compromise your position to give them just for a second. That's what I had when I worked on another company is book it and make money. And you just can't do something like that. If you don't think something is right or it's something good for them. So, and there's no reason why you can't be successful. And I've proven it that you can be successful doing it the right way. And that's the main thing. That is the main thing. Yeah. And it's interesting because they say that, I mean, when you forget about that dollar and you forget about that transaction, that they just come. You focus on the impact and you focus on who this speaker is going to be serving. And this idea that they are serving the audience, they are serving the communities that they're going to fill them with knowledge to be able to go out there and be an extension of their work, that you really have to operate in that same mindset as an agent, that our job is to get them in front of that audience. Now we know when you break it down, that when you get someone in front of an audience, the commission comes with it. But when you focus on how many people can we impact, how many groups can we put the speaker in front of, how many conferences can they be in front of to really start to move the needle in the right direction around this subject area. You did mention about 1968, New York Times Magazine featured you and a 10 page article as a young impresario highlighting your unorthodox style and uncanny sense of knowledge, uh, how to successfully match client speaker and program. 1970, Newsweek dubbed you as king of the talkies. APB was even listed in the Guinness Book of World Records from 1970 to 1980 that, as the largest lecture agency in the world. And this all happened within your first five years of organized business. Yeah. Did you ever feel pressure early on as to how you would sustain this growth? Because I'm thinking six decades later, you must be pretty satisfied. No, no, I didn't. I really I had a lot of confidence. I just had a lot of belief that I was just beginning. And like you said, in five years, look what I did in five years. I said, hey, we could even do more. I was a great believer of how much of an impact that we could have as a company in this world, not just the country. The country is what I was talking about that. And of course, then we became more international. But the bottom line is, no, I had a lot of confidence. I even during the early 70s, I think 1970, he started, I even tried to start my own television network on college campuses, because I believe that TV was not telling it like it is. And if somebody wants to use that F word, I hate to say that, but you want to have a person say what they really believe and don't have any type of censorship. So I set up the APB television network and we had over a hundred schools paying me a thousand dollars a school just to be on the network. And I supplied them with a, uh, with a TV and a monitor and a playback unit, et cetera. Unfortunately, we got ripped off on a lot of them on college campuses, but nevertheless, we actually had these TVs there, the playback units, and we would give them once a month, a different program. And one of the first series was like waiting for the change. We had people like Abby Hoffman on it, Ralph Nader on it, Frank Mankiewicz, used to be press sector for Bobby Kennedy. Uh, we had all these people on that program. Then we had other programs with Dick Gregory, Another brought with Jane Fonda. It was all about Vietnam, et cetera, and what was going on there. We even had a program where we had Bill Baird, who was the leading proponent of abortion. We had a program called, do you own your own body? It was amazing. And we had the first time ever, I don't think these days you would even have it, an actual abortion shown on television. Wow. And it was unbelievable, but X was free. It was showing what can be real, honest television. Okay. And it was produced very well. I had three super producers. One went on to be for 21 years was at 60 minutes was Mike Wallace's number one producer. He worked for me, two other producers. Again, that was something we did. And we really enjoyed doing this because we felt we could make a change. And we did because I had students calling me up in like in the seventies and saying, Hey, Mr. Walker, my name is so-and-so. You remember me when I worked at Syracuse. I was at Syracuse University. It was so good that you helped me get programming, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm working for the governor of so-and-so. I'm working for this big corporation. I'm working for that. That's what these kids, these young students of the 60s, late mid 60s into early 70s became the young executives of the 70s and 80s. And that's how a lot of these people, we went from being a college and university agency, which was huge, to 
corporations, associations, and all these other markets, which, you know, because they knew what we were doing and they believed that were committed to what we were actually doing and committed to giving them the honest and the types of programs that they really would enjoy and would, would actually, they would learn something, which that was the most important thing. Yeah. And I think that something to note. I didn't even know, I think I knew about APB TV, but I didn't know the origin of it is that this consistent, and it seems as if it's the need for you to be thinking outside the box and being creative. Like you can't just ever sit in that kind of, this is how we do things. And I know that with our world and being in sales around people, it's natural that you have to think on your feet and you do have to be creative because unlike other sales industries, our products talk to us. So, you know, we not just program to talk to us, they're human beings just like us. And if they want to change the way in which they want to be sold, we adapt that way. And so to think that from a creative angle, that even at that time, you were so able to not only think in a creative direction and innovate the way you think, but also to gain the trust of people that were allowing you to think that way, which I think it's time has gone on, that's become harder and harder is keeping the trust of the talent to understand that everything is deep in our veins around, and it is in our blood as a company that we are able to always pair this, as I said before, you know, program, client, and speaker. It's a big part of the process. It is, it is true. And I'll tell you that I have the answer why there is a little more of a distrust, let's say, in certain ways. So what happened was at the time, we were the only major agency, okay, in that area and doing what we were doing. Okay. Then when other agencies got in that, not only can you do something good, which is what people want, but you can make a lot of money with that too. All right. They jumped on the bandwagon. So what did they do again, whether it's lower their commission. So that would be a way that they can get somebody away from a company like ours or whatever they did. And there again, you know, a lot of companies, schools, have bad experiences. So unfortunately, once you have a bad experience, then you label everybody in the industry, you know? So that's how it really changed. I'm telling you in the late sixties and the seventies, it was a dream. It was a dream really into the eighties. That's when it started more in mid seventies, late seventies into the eighties is that's when it started because there's all these different agencies cropped up. They were seeing that this is hey, this lecture business is a lucrative business and they jumped on the bandwagon. Yeah. You've represented hundreds of speakers, as I think we've noticed in this conversation in just in itself, and you were always on the cutting edge of just who was important, who wasn't important, who was going to make a change. And I want to talk quickly about just the individual speakers, but more kind of the impact that you even made on them. And so, you know, thinking that, you know, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X before their legacies were stitched into history, John Kerry before his political career, Ronald Reagan before he was president. So many more, as you mentioned, Dick Gregory and Jane Fonda, Abby Hoffman, Andy Warhol, Arthur Ashe, said Harold Wilson, Miguel Gorbachev, Desmond Tutu, Larry King, Dan Rather, Angela yeah, Davis, yeah. Yeah. so many more too. And then when you fast forward to today, we're representing the young people, the change makers, the people that are taking the biggest risks in our world, David Hogg, Masi Alinjad, Dmitry Muratov, William Barber. Have you ever thought about just the individual impact that you've made on these people and the speakers, but their families and the generational wealth that you've helped create for especially some of these people of color that at the time, people of color making that kind of money was unheard of and just the trajectory that you were able to be a, such a big part of. No, you're right. And let me go back to Dick Gregory because Dick said to me one time, I laugh about it because I say this so many times when people talk to me about Dick. Dick looked me right in the face and says, Bob, well, you saved my life. And I said, Greg, you saved my life. Basically with mutual, I gave him the platform. He performed fantastic. It was fantastic. All right. So yeah, we both made a lot of money, but we did something good too. So it's great if you can dot all the I's, as they say, and cross the T's. We booked the speaker. They loved the speaker. They paid and everybody was happy. So that was really wonderful. But the type of people that we represented gave them, I'm thinking about even sports. If you think about legends, I mean, representing people like Bill Russell just passed away. I could tell some great stories about Bill, unbelievable stories about Bill. The interesting story, just a quick story. 
I didn't know if Bill could really speak because whenever he'd be on television, he would be grunting most of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> grunting. And I didn't think he'd make a speech. And I was representing Red Orbach, who was then the coach of the Celtics. And Red was doing a lot of real great dates for me. And he had a date in Michigan. And he called me up to Bob, I can't do this date. This came up. I said, oh my God. He says, but look, Bill Russell will do this. I said, Bill Russell, can he speak? He says, trust me, he'll do this. So I had really no other alternative. It was like a day later. So I said, okay, get him to do the date. So he does the date. They love him. Absolutely love I said, oh my God. So I call him up and say, Bill, come in. I want to talk to you about representation. Because so I figured, let's represent him. Comes in the office, great wide, you know, we're old with that. <laughs> oh, laugh, great guy. He comes in the office and we sit down and he says, okay, so how do we work? I said, at the time we were making like a 30% commission. That was what our commission was in the industry. 30%. He said, 30%, that's too much. I said, that's what we get it. No, 20%. I said, Mr. Russell, I'll make a deal with you. He said, what's that? He said, let's play for it. I said, play what? He goes, something like basketball. Now he's laughing. <laughs> he's looking at me. I'm a short guy. He's seven foot tall. And he's saying, <laughs> okay, let's play. So I said, here's what we're going to do. See this trash barrel? I ripped up these yellow line pads. I ran them to the papers. I said, we're going to roll them up in balls and we're going to do 10 foul shots. And I knew that Bill Russell in basketball was a horrible foul shooter. So I said, let's do this. So he says, okay. So we sit down and I go, wow, 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 wow. Nine out of 10. He goes, bang, walk. That's it. Of course I was doing, I used to do it every day. You throw it in. So it was fixed in a way. So we got 30%. But to have a person like Bill Russell, have a person like Jackie Robinson, have a person like Muhammad Ali, who was a great speaker of mine and a great friend. And it's interesting because I lost touch after many years. And it was interesting because he, when he was ill, he, of course, he was really very ill and it was hard for him to do anything. So of course, for many, many years, he did 10, 12, 15 years, whatever it was. And I was at the White House with one of my speakers, Paul Recespedino, who was the Hotel Rwanda. And he was here in the country. We were representing him. And he was getting the Medal of Honor by President Bush. And he could bring his family, but he could invite two other or three other people to come along. So he brought myself, my wife, and I forgot the person who portrayed him in the movie. Uh, Don Cheadle. But Don Cheadle. So Don Cheadle came, three of us came. And we get there and it was unbelievable. There was nine other people, 10 people get the award. People like Greenspan, uh, Carol Burnett. And who was there? Muhammad Ali. And I didn't know what that. He was there and the poor guy was sitting down and he was like drooling a bit. And I felt so sad seeing a guy, I was a whole, a like tremendous person, you know, a powerful guy sitting there like that. And I said to my wife, what should I do? And I walk up to him and I said, Muhammad, it's Bob Walker. His eyes open bright, fed up with a bear hug and grabbed me and kissed me. I blew my mind. It blew my mind because here I thought he was like three quarters away sleeping on the chair. And when I said that, so he still remembered, it made me feel so good that he still remembered because we had this great relationship and we did things that, you know, a lot of people said we couldn't do because they didn't want him to box and all that. And we came up with some ideas how we could get around that. So we had some very interesting things. There's loads of stories about it. But yes, people like that, Jane Fonder, John Kerry, blew my mind with John Kerry. He came back from the Vietnam War and we were big on against the war and had a lot of speakers who were speaking about that. The speakers that were all over in every college in the country. And he was veterans against the war. That was his world. So we were sending them all over the country. And then of course he got into politics. He said to me, if it wasn't for you, Bob, I wouldn't be where I am right now because we raised all this money. I was able to be in the, you know, exposed to the public and the rest was history. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you mentioned Paul Recessa Beguina. I think it's important to mention he is wrongfully detained currently in Rwanda, 20 months on terrorism charges that many human rights people uh, say is a sham and it's a farce <laughs> and it's revenge on what he did during the story. And so people can uh, write to your senators, write to your congressmen, go do your part to help. And, you know, I think that for me is the part I think of your story when you look at just these moments of history where you can look back on your life and you can say, holy crap, you know, you live life and so many people live life. You think when you can have those moments of just saying, you know, that you were a part of something that impacted so many. And I think that single-handedly, at least when you can look at times of history and the speakers you represented, 
that were a part of a group of people that were changing the course of history. And you look at a lot of the civil rights speakers that you've mentioned. In my mind, there's really only one person that you've represented that really had such an impact on the world that maybe him and maybe two, maybe one other person in that room in Reykjavik. Other than those moments, he really held the key to changing the world. And that's your friend and bless his soul, Mikhail Gorbachev, who recently passed away. And Gorbachev, obviously for everyone that, you know, to the world, we know him as the former head of Russia, but I think that he rose to power as just a functionary in, in the Soviet Union system and showed the world, but more his own people that there was a different kind of Russia that was possible and a more open democratic Russia that placed the freedom and the well-being of their own people as their number one priority. Can you tell us a little bit about your friend and just what he taught you about leadership? Yeah, well, let me, let me say this to you. First of all, he was brilliant. Not too many people really impressed me. I didn't say he impressed me, you know, I'm not sitting there like a teenager looking and say, oh my God, there's very few people, but. There was something about it. He had such charisma. There was something about him. And it's interesting. And I can understand the stories that he tells about, and you're saying people that changed the world. My other client with it was Ronald Reagan and Ian Reagan, really, I think you have to say a one, two punch in the case of Reagan. I started with Reagan when his two key aides, Mike Deaver and Pete Hatterford came up to see me. I didn't go after him after he left as governor of California. And they said, look, he wants to be president of the United States. Plain and simple. He wants exposure. He needs two things. One is the exposure with the right groups. And the other thing is he needs to build a war chest, the financial war chest. And they do this with booking, with making money for this. So we did that. And the rest is history. We did it right before Boyden, and then he became president. But pushing that aside, the Gorbachev relationship, because I've asked him a lot of questions about Ronald Rick. And that's the thing. I wanted to know because here I've represented the man and I've worked with him. And I wanted to know from President Gorbachev all about him. And it was interesting because he, I must say, played it a little bit. Like he said, Mr. Gorbachev, take down the wall. So I was going to take down the wall anyway. He didn't have to tell me to do it, but he was, as an actor, he says, he was a great actor. He would like to get and make those things. So it was just cute the way he would say these things to me. We would have these conversations because when I started to represent him, right after he left as president and not only did he travel, but his wife, Reza Maxima, his wife traveled with him and he had an entourage. We had like eight people. He had two guards. They had a doctor. They had, of course, Pavel Poloshenko, who was his interpreter for years. And one of his key people, I was at Likotel, who was his main advisor. I traveled there because that was part of the deal. When I made the deal with him in Moscow, I said to him, Mr. President, when you travel and you go throughout America or wherever. I will always have somebody from my office travel with you. So I'll never forget this. He grabs my hand and he said, and points his finger at me. He says, no, you. <laughs> okay. You know? Yeah. What do you say? <laughs> and of course, of course. So, but you know what? You're talking about leadership. The man was so sharp. It was unbelievable. You couldn't put anything over on this guy. You know, it was interesting. The first. Four we had, we had him at the University of Virginia, I think. Anyway, we had him for that rate. And I'll never forget, I mean, the first thing that really got me was I called up one of my aides that was uh, in the city and I said, how's the weather? So I wanted to know I wanted to give him, I wanted to be smart. I'm in a private plate from Moscow with him. And they say, it's good. It's great. Okay. We get there. It's pouring. <laughs> so now I'm the bad. They're looking at me like, what is he? I said, oh, no, we're good. So you had a city. There was a picture in the front of the. Richmond newspaper of me holding an umbrella with Gorbachev getting out of the plane, but he had a twinkle in his eye. You knew when he was really upset at you and you knew when he just joking. But the thing I learned about it was interesting because the first night at this hotel, we were at a nice hotel, all of a sudden his aides banging on like the one said, there's no water, the water, something happened to the water. It was a Sunday, something happened to the water. So I said, okay, we'll get that, but don't tell the president, let him sleep. Well, don't know because we don't want him to wake up. It was amazing how they shut it. They were so concerned about it. So I was cool. I said, look, don't worry. So we got it going. We thank God. By the time he got up, there was water. You know what I mean? But from that day on, and from a lot of other days after that, Gorbachev and his people gave me a nickname. They used to call me Magic Walker. You know why Magic Walker? If something had to be done, I got it done. 
So they call Magic Walker. Magic Walker, get at this. Magic Walker. <laughs> and that's what they used to call me. He used to call me. But I could spend the next five hours telling you stories about President Gorbachev because the man, uh, first of all, he was a very dear friend. And not only that, but even my wife, who I took on tours with us when his wife was living, because I wanted her to be with the razor. And because if we had things to do, and Reza was like sometimes in the afternoon, and my wife could speak Russian, Reza couldn't speak English, but they had one thing in common, shopping. <laughs> shopping. And my wife, if you, know, you look at my wife's ring, oh, oh, you know. So we set them out with an interpreter, and they went shopping. So that's how they used to do it. But when Reza Maximova passed away, of course, myself, my wife, we flew in for the funeral. President Gorbachev asked my wife, Fran, and myself to be honor guards at the casket. They have four honor guards at each corner. I thought that was a great honor because, my God, you know, how many years we know her? It wasn't like all our lives, you know, but they felt that closeness to us. Well, again, we had this special relationship, and he knew that I was taking care of him. That was the thing that's important. He had the confidence that if anything happened, it was a potential problem. I would fix it. So he had that confidence in me. And it was interesting because he looked up to me in a way. And here I'm look at him as, my God, he was one of the most powerful men in the world. And he's a lot looking up to me in certain things. So it made me feel very good. Yeah. I think it is interesting when you say that he looked at you like you were this big, powerful man. But when you're like, I'm looking at the most powerful man in the world. And I think it's something that... It's something that we have to remind ourselves that when we're in the position that we're in, because I know there's some speakers now that I handle that they look at me and they're not Mikhail Gorbachev, but they look at me in that same space, in that same space, because they know that we are experts in what we're doing. And I think that when you can, you know, we're not challenging that what they do and we're not competing against them for what they're doing. We are in a way helping them further the work they're doing and the things that are important to them. But when you do have people that you are representing that, also know that you are the person that is helping them move this forward and they really have that trust and respect with you. Those are the perfect people that we want and they're the people that help us do this for you know a good amount of time. And so I do joke with people close to me about how it took pretty much a worldwide pandemic for you to slow down. I know you were definitely taking off a few days towards the end of the week pre-COVID, but you were working remotely then before okay. everyone had to re work remotely. And, you know, this industry really fuels you and makes you who you are. So it doesn't really shock me that you'd want to keep it going. But I also know how important your family is to you and how loved you are by them and how much you love them as well. How have you balanced one of the most illustrious careers on the planet with being a good husband, father, grandfather, but most importantly, even just good to yourself? Well, let me say, you, you are right. First of all, I love my wife. Married 62 years. I know her for 65 years and we're still married and, and she puts up with me because she knows me. Okay. And she knows how much I do love her. My kids are saying, wait, what's that old saying? The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So the kids have seen the way I treat my wife. We've always been a close knit family. My three children, even when they're growing up, we always like to eat together. And so one thing was important, always eating together. I like today where kids come home, wives are playing, this one's playing tennis, playing golf and all that. I didn't do that because that takes you away from your family. My time on weekends, I try to devote to my family. Sure. I've traveled in the early days a lot. I was flying over to Russia for my God, three weeks at clip. So yes, that happened, but my kids knew how much I loved them and how much I talked to them. I used to listen a lot, what their problems were, and I try to deal with it with them. Okay. And my wife too, which was poor. And we also taught them the value of a dollar. We taught them the value of relationships with people. We try to put them in the right direction. And that's as important as what I did in my business, you know, my family, because I have to tell you, I look at my three children. I look at my five grandchildren. They're all great. And all are doing, all are getting successful careers in their own, my grandchildren which I'm seeing, which is fantastic. And I feel very proud of that. I really feel so proud of them. So the bottom line is we've done a good job. My wife and myself, I don't take all the credit. I have to give my credit a lot to my wife. Of course, let's face it. You know, I always say she had the most important job. My job was, yeah, I'm 
in the lecture business, not booking programs, not making money, et cetera. But she was there trying to make sure the kids are rolling up properly, that they have whatever they need and the school and the work and the things they do. And they all work. They all had jobs after school, even though we could afford that they didn't have to have jobs, but we felt it was important to have jobs and to know the value of a dollar. I never was extravagant. I never joined the country clubs and golf clubs that people wanted to want to join this golf. I just never did. I just believe I lived myself. I, I didn't like to show off. And any of these stories, you know, what has happened? They've come to me to write about me. And that's the one thing I've never done. And you know this, I've never really been that proactive in going out and saying, Hey, let's get a PR firm and let's do this story on me and that story on me. And that's what I never did anything. Every story, everything, whether it was the wall street journal, whether it was the New York times, whether it was the Guinness book of war and records and all, they all came to me. And again, the rest was history, but family's important and it's tough. It really is tough. You talked about this, the pandemic, that was a traumatic for me. I adapted it. So it's fine that working alone, you can work alone. And, and I learned another thing too, because I was against anybody work. Oh, I felt you have to be in the office. That's the only way you can do it. Some people have to be in the office. No question about it. Some people can adapt accordingly and can be as effective working from home. It all is a matter of their own discipline. It, it, it's all discipline. You know, if they can do it. And I disciplined myself. I found myself, especially in the early days of pandemic. And my wife was wonderful because she understood and gave me my, the room, as they say, you know, she wasn't, you know, bucking me like a lot of people would say, oh, come on in, have that, have this, let's go here. Come on, let's go shopping. You know, oh, she knew that when I was in the office working, I was in my room. She didn't bother me. She would some stick a head in if she saw I was off the phone and say, you want something for lunch? You want this? You want a cup of tea? Or, and that was it. And that really makes a wonderful marriage, a terrific marriage. And I have to tell you, I'll give a lot of credit to my wife that was very much behind my success. In the beginning, when I went into business, we couldn't afford, we couldn't afford who did it, to be frank with you. And because my wife was my secretary. I couldn't afford a secretary. So I had my wife with us that we started. She was pregnant with my daughter, Amy. We used to, it's a funny story. We have a home, we paid $250 mortgage in the Peabody, Massachusetts. And we had an office in Boston, a very small office. And every night when we would drive home, we would always listen to the radio and listen to a disc jockey named Arnie Wu Ginsburg. And he used to have a commercial for this place called the Adventure Car Hop. He says, tell them that Wu sent you, and today the special is you get two cheeseburgers for the price of one. Today is two chili burgers for the price of one. So we used to live, listen, every day. And that's what we lived on, two for one, because we couldn't afford two cows. We afford one, and we lived that way. So everything wasn't wonderful. We lived it, but you know what? We had our lungs and we were dedicated and believe, and she believed in me and she knew that I could be successful, even though we had virtually nothing in the bank, a mortgage in the house, baby coming due in, in a couple of months. And you know, the yeah. man says, you know, I've always said, somebody watches over you. I'm so overly religious, but somebody was watching over there and they're looking at you and they're saying, if you're a good person and you do good things and help people and try to do the right thing, you'll be taken care of. And you know what, Drew, I've been taken care of, let me tell you. And I think that the work we do also, it has this impact as agents that sometimes what we're going through in our lives, give or take, depending on what it is, is you and I know we, a colleague had something horrible happen in their life. The big things in life you can't run away from. But when you look at the little things that weigh people down or the things that make people sad, the things that make people mad and angry, it's hard in our world to stay stuck on those things for a while because we see so much optimism in front of us. We see people making changes on such a large scale around the biggest issues that it really tells you, oh, that what you have going on in your life or that thing that's bringing you down, weighing you down, that's challenging you. Think about that person that you're working with that has to deal with X, Y, and Z. I mean, we look at Masi, who we just signed, yeah. what she's working on in the world and what she yeah. went through in her home country and what the people in her home country go through and, and just those things that we'll never have to deal with that yeah. we look at. And I say that it really is the truth is that this business can help you get through the hardest of times and the hardest of things. And I look at my own life and just this place that you've curated that was a saving space for me. 
a space that was safe and that when I decided to change the trajectory of my life and to stop using substance the way I was, you know, if I didn't have this safe space and if I didn't have my career that wasn't just what I did, but the people I surrounded myself, the people that we get to work with and represent. And if I didn't have that atmosphere, I don't know if my story would be the same. And I think that that's something that all people can look at is to just say that not only find something that you are passionate about that, you know, makes a living for you, but also make sure that what you do for work and what you do that Monday through Friday, which is the majority of your week is also serving you in a way that helps right. you with the other parts of your life, because it really can make or break you in that side of things. So thank you, because for me, if I didn't have APB, when I hit my personal moment of rock bottom as a way to say, okay, you're going to change this part of your life, but you also have a lot of good that's going on in your life that you can turn to. It's not going to be as hard as you thought it was going to be. That makes going through those hard things a lot easier. It's a true statement than what making right now, Drew, because sometimes even talking to you right now, okay, I have this back problem, as I told you. Yeah. Though. Stenosis of the spine. I was, I've been in acne. I didn't sleep last night and I'm hoping I can get a shot in the back, but it doesn't matter. This last 45 minutes, an hour, I didn't feel any pain. I didn't feel any pain. You know why my mind is thinking I'm reminiscing as I'm talking because you know, you're bringing up a lot of points that I'm thinking about these stories and this wonderful lot of things that I felt we did. And to me, that makes me feel good. Just like I always said, laughter, the greatest medicine in the world. Well, in this case, the business and me talking about it, me uh, being involved in the business day in, day out, you know what I mean? Still keeps me young. At my yeah. age, 86, I feel like I'm in the fifties and forties, but this makes me feel super. I've always said that, especially if you're surrounded with people like yourself and other people we have at the company and we have the greatest crew of people. And I think that's very important. It's a great support mechanism to support. So. God forbid you get down, you will have this great support mechanism around us that will help us get through whatever adversity there is. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've always taken that attitude. There isn't a problem that cannot be solved. Just think a way of doing and solve the problem. You could solve it. Let's talk about it, more action and deal with it. And so, you know, you could do those things. This business has been very rewarding to me and to my family, my extended family, like yourself and other people, because you are, we're all family. Yeah. And it's very, very important. And like I said, the day I'm no longer around on this earth, people can look back and say, he was a good guy. He really did the right thing. And that's all I'm looking for. I'm just, Hey, I did the right thing. And to use the old Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. That's for certain. Well, we're going to finish it's my favorite part. It's the same 10 questions I ask all guests, you know, it's called the takeaway 10. And so the first question, what always makes you laugh? My wife sometimes. <laughs> That's good. That's a good thing. If you could ask one person, one question, who would it be? And what would you ask? One question? I'd love to ask my doctor, why the hell can't stop this pain? <laughs> Waves. <laughs> what advice do you have for young people entering the workplace? Follow your dream and don't let up. I mean, when people say it cannot be done, you can get it done. I mean, don't give up just because somebody says, or some expert says it's not the right thing or that. If you really believe in it, you'll find a way. People have told me many times, you're crazy or you shouldn't do this or that, that. And I did it. And you know what? I have to tell you, my track record is pretty damn good because I believe in it. Above all, you have to believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, then it doomed. How do we measure our lives in years and moments and accomplishments? Something else? That's a tough question. How do you measure your lives? Years and accomplishing as much in, the, in years and a lot of other things I did because there were other things I've done in my life. I don't want to get into it. We'll spend another two hours. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about it, I've been successful in other things. I produced the Broadway show in Greece and I toured nationally. I always wanted to be a producer and I got the rights to it after the movie came out and we produced it nationally. So I did that. We were looking to buy the New England Patriots and I took over for two years as president 
at the new the stadium at the time, Sullivan Stadium. So I mean, we had major concerts with U2, David Bowie, Pink Floyd, Madonna, or you name it, the Rolling Stones. So we had major talent and that's, I enjoyed doing it. So these are things that said, what the hell, how do you go from a speaker to do these things? I believe in myself that I can do it. And you know what? I did it. So maybe the answer is the impact. You measure your life by the impact you make. Name one thing about yourself that you will never change. I'll never change the way I talk. People say you talk fast, you talk a lot. And you know what I always say? I have a lot of things to say, a little time to say it in. And if they don't like me, I'm sorry. But the one thing is when I say things, when I talk things, it's coming from the heart. I love that. Which three people, past or present, would you invite to a dinner party? Would I invite a lot of people, more than three people? Well, Julian Bond was one of my dearest friends. You know, I wanted Julian. Larry King was another one. I would have Larry and, of course, Gorbachev. And Archbishop, too. He was a special person. He loved wings. I love to get, I had him in Aruba for, for a little, he was there. We had a, actually a booking there. And we took him to this restaurant. And you had to see, there he and It sounded like Gorbachev with the chicken. You had to see him with all the hot sauce all over his face. Here's the Archbishop. <laughs> Nobel Prize winner, but he was such a sincere human being, just like the Gorbachev. I'd love to have a person like that. And like I say, there's many others that I would love to have. There are a lot of speakers that I wouldn't invite to my home. They had great subjects. I felt it was important for them to speak in front of an audience, but they weren't my cup of tea. I didn't think they were as sincere as yeah. the people that I was. Many of them, they were doing it for the uh, For the money. money. That was it. And to me, that wasn't the way to do it. You have to do it. We have to love what you're doing. And it usually comes out on the platform. If somebody loves what they're doing, they're going to be on the platform. They're going to do it. I mean, people are going to see that, that they love it. That's why we have a lot of our people. They do the job. They might not be the names that uh, like the Obamas and the, the Clintons and those things. But let me tell you, these people are making more of an impact in our country and in the world than these leaders, these big names that other agencies are booking. I really get a lot of pride out of representing a lot of these individuals that are movers and shakers that are trying to change the world and change our country, change the world. That's the most important thing that I do. To answer that question around that way, there are many people. I, have I think there is four. You can have four. I'll give you four. Right, give me four. Yeah. Yeah. My wife's a good cook. So exactly. <laughs> How did you find a community and are you a part of one? Well, I'm part of many communities, you know, I mean, I can't stick one community. I'm involved with a lot of communities. People call me every day or want to get involved this or that and this. And of course, I, I'm an activist. Let's put it this way. In my own way, I'm an activist. If somebody says something, I get involved in it if I really believe in it. I do believe in a lot of things. You can't put one thing to who oh, do you believe in civil rights? Yeah, of course. Do you believe in gun control? Yes, I believe in that. Do you believe in it? Yeah. I mean, it's all these things I can talk about. I'll go on all, all these areas and I'll say, of course I do. Yeah. yeah. My own views on this. I'll never discount what one of my speakers say if I don't agree with them. I'll always listen to them and I'll draw my own conclusion. I won't argue with them except because they're again, that's not my job. My job at this end of the desk and there on the other end is to be able to give them the opportunity of the platform to go out and speak to the audiences that will make the decisions based on what these people are saying. Have you ever looked in the mirror and not recognized the person staring back? Well, once I remember looking in the mirror, that was the day before I got married. And I said, who the hell is that guy? My head was swelling. And I was like, my mother actually, I said, I have to go to that guy. I was uptight, but no, joking with, no, I look in the mirror. I know who I am. I look yeah. in the mirror, I know who I am. And I know what I've done and I don't have to brag about it, but in my heart, I know. And the people that I know that are close with me, they also know. That's all that matters. I don't care about anybody else, really. Yeah. Last question. What are you grateful for in this moment? I'm grateful to have my health, really. I'm really grateful to have my health. To me, to get money, to get everything. I mean, you hear stories left and right. Just today, a good friend of mine, 83, just died. And we hear stories every day. And especially when you get into my age, <laughs> there's more after people passing away. To me, health is important. I just want to keep my health. And I'll tell you something. Uh, Again, I just believe by me being active, it's wild to say this. To me, I found the secret of longevity. The secret of longevity is work, is immerse yourself. And that's what I've done. I'm immersing myself in the business and thinking. I feel mentally, I feel fantastic. I can't help it if I have a little arthritis in the back or I have the stenosis. 
but that should be the biggest problem. But health is, to me, forget anything, forget anything else. Health is the most important. And it's funny, my father, let him rest in peace, used to always say, whenever he made any toasts or anything, he says, to this and this, but especially to your health. I could not understand it in those days when I was younger and all that. Now I understand. <laughs> health is very important. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Bob, and for sharing your story around the impact we can make as leaders and human beings. The impact you have made on me will never leave me, and I look forward to more years of collaboration, creativity, and friendship. That's all, folks. Join us next week for another exciting conversation on Small Steps, Big Change. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of the Small Steps, Big Change podcast. I hope that this episode inspired you to let go of whatever is holding you back and take the first small step. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, follow our YouTube channel, The Small Steps Big Change Podcast, and connect with me on Instagram. Remember, no matter what you are going through, without taking small steps, you are limiting your potential to create big change. So take that first small step today. I promise you that you won't regret it.